Always like Paul said, Paul had the equivalent of probably three to seven doctor degrees. Can you imagine? Three to seven doctor degrees. Good Lord, I'm having a hard time with that from Lee right now. I can't imagine three to seven. And you know what he said? Out of all my learning, out of all the things I know, he said, there's only one thing I need to remember, and that is Jesus Christ and him crucified. i got to remember the cross. Amen. Remember the cross. Everybody stand up. We're going to sing, leave me to the cross. Go ahead. God, we got to have you. God, we got to have the cross. Lord, we got to have you. Lord, we love you. We thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Let's go ahead. to the cross. Philippians 
chapter 2. Let's just start with verse 1, okay? Got your Bible, say amen. amen. If you don't, there's one in front of you. Say all me and get the one in front of you. That's right. If there's anyone in front of you, look on with the person beside you. Ready? Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. I won't keep you long this morning. Alright? If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, fulfill you my joy that you may be like-minded. Y'all say like-minded. Like that means to think, listen, it doesn't mean necessarily to think alike, but it means to be going in the right, in the same direction, okay? We don't have to all think the same, but we need to be all going in the same direction, okay? If you want to get along, be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing, y'all say nothing. nothing. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory or anger or just doing it for yourself. I'm either angry or I'm just doing this for myself. Vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. That's easier than said than done. Amen. Look not every man on his own things, but let every man also on the things of others. In other words, take care of other people if you can. Let this man be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and, and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in likeness of men. Wow, y'all stretch forth your hands this way. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, God, that we're here today, Lord, that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. I ask you right now, Lord, to minister to us and through us, Father, to help us understand that you have something special for us today and for us not to miss it. Lord, I know, God, there's many things on all of our minds, God. There's many things, many troubles and trials and tribulations that we all have to face and some we have to face even as we are sitting here right now. And there's others that we're going to have to face as soon as we step back out of that door. But I ask you right now, Lord, to help us, God, to keep our mind on you, not to be distracted. Anything in this service that will distract us, I ask you right now, Lord, to move it apart from us, Lord, and help us, God, to get what you're trying to tell us in the name of Jesus, we pray. The church said, amen. amen, amen. You can be seated. Take somebody's hand and say, the past is behind us. The future is ahead of us. God is with us. And nothing shall be impossible. That's right. Nothing shall be impossible. Okay, we're going to talk about dealing with difficult people. Look at somebody beside you and say, he's talking about somebody. <laughs> Husband, look at your wife and say, he can't be talking about you, dear. Husband, oh, give me a chance to get you a good brownie point. Okay, so you see, <laughs> see those guys there, amen. Look, look, how many people do you know that when they start talking, you hear that? trying to tell you good things, but you have to stop and have to filter out the So it's like a word I've had to learn really, really hard, especially when you, all of you, when you work with other people, and work with people from, from other areas and other cultures, and they've done things different up at, at Fountain. I'm telling you what, there were so many cultures at Fountain, and there were so many people, and, and so many times I walked through the plant and I would hear chalkboards, hear fingernails on chalkboards, and I had to learn how to shut out the chalkboard so I could hear what they were saying. Now, now, all of us have got these people in our lives. We all have them. We have them in our past. Uh, uh, has anybody ever, we're going to sing up here right there. You go, we have them in our past. Has, has anybody ever had a teacher that drove you crazy? Anybody ever had a neighbor that drove you crazy? Anybody had other people? <laughs> That would drive you crazy. They're in your past, your present. There's going to always be somebody in your future. Don't think that if I can get past this person, I'm out of it. If I can get past this person that's griping my last nerve, if I can get past them, I won't have to worry about this anymore. Guess what? False. Very much false. <coughs> because God, in his infinite mercy and wisdom, a lot of times allow the chalkboard people in your life to teach you a lesson. And as he's teaching you a lesson, if you just keep avoiding the chalkboard people, you'll
You'll never learn the lesson. Here's what's going to happen. You think if I ever just get them out of my life, then I'm covered. No, because if you just get rid of them or move away from them or hold your fingers in your ears, God's going to keep sending those people until you learn the lesson. Okay? So, 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 again, how, how many's got those people? Amen? We all got them. Amen? You know, don't point up here at me because I know I'm not one of them. <laughs> all right, so, 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 here we go. Oh, Lord, have mercy. No, that looks familiar. <laughs> wow. Do you know that every last one of us can be grumpy? Believe it or not. Every one of us can be grumpy, and some of us are very difficult to deal with. All of us can be that way. Every last one of us. We all have those times where, you know, uh, at, 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 at Fountain, I would tell them all the time, when the engineers come in, they'd be delaying on the table like they lost it or, or, or grumping each other. I said, we can't really go out and talk to everybody in this plant. You can't be looking like that. You can't be acting like that. I said, now, here's what they'd always say. I said, why are you acting like that this morning? And they said, well, I guess I just... Woke up on the wrong side of the bed. And I'd say, every time they'd say, I'd say, don't blame it on the bed. And then I'd say, go back home, get in your car, go back home and climb in your bed and climb out the right side and then come back to work. So look, look, look. Look at somebody say, don't blame it on the bed. Well, if somebody says they got up on the wrong side of the bed, actually what they're saying is I didn't get a good night's sleep. You know, I tossed and turned all night. Or I didn't get any REM sleep. There's all kinds of things that goes on. And so, so you, it's possible that, that your sleep, not the bed, but your sleep can cause these problems. So, so from time to time, ooh, back up here. Where's this thing going? This thing has lost its mind. Where, look at this thing. How's it gone crazy on me? Come on now. I'm about to go out here. See, some of y'all being so dead. Y'all don't want to hear it so bad you push the button on me. That's right. See, that's what I'm talking about. See? Now, here we go. Now, here we go. Let's get this one guy up here. This one woman. Here we go. Let's try it one more time. The battery must be getting weak. Or either I just got happy and pushed it real hard. Okay. So, so, all of us can be grumpy from time to time. And every last one of us from time to time are going to encounter folks who behave the same way or worse. Sometimes people actually scare me. I don't mean scare me. change that word from scare. I'm trying to get away from the word scare and fear. I'm trying to leave those words alone. I felt something burning the other day. I said, I'm afraid something's burning in here. And I said, excuse me. I'm concerned something's burning in here. And the person said, well, it's okay to be afraid of something burning. I said, no, I'm not afraid. I'm concerned. If I was afraid, I'd run out in the yard. I'm concerned. I'm going to find out what's burning so I can stop it. Okay, so y'all try to take that word afraid and fear out of your vocabulary. So use the word concerned, okay? So, 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 so matter of fact, you kind of take power away from the devil and other people when you do that. So, 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 so again, there's people that when they come up and I hear them talking to their kids or I hear them talking to one another or spouses talking to one another, I get concerned because I know that they've gone beyond joking and now it's become a lifestyle. And they're so hard on each other that I tell you what, I would not want to have to live in that situation where I was always on pins and needles and always wondering if I was going to mess up. Have I got to dot every I? Have I got to cross every T? There's no grace. It's all living by the letter of the law. I cannot stand to be by myself in that situation. So, so when you deal with difficult people, and you will, these tips are going to help. So I'm going to give you just a few today, and we'll finish it up next week. Ready? Y'all say, put on your steel toe shoes. How do I, now, now ask me, how do I deal with difficult people? Somebody say that. Here we go. Ready? Number one, you're going to love this. You're probably going to clap when you see this one. Ready? You're going to clap your hands when you see it. Look at that. Make sure you're not the one being difficult. There's so many times I come in, I come into somebody and I've got a good attitude and I'm trying to give them every benefit of every doubt and trying to be nice to them and I'm trying to say the right thing and they come in already grumpy, already ready to pick a fight. They've already had the conversation in their head and they've already figured out what I'm going to say and how I'm going to attack and blah, blah, blah. And they're all ready to fight right from the start. And so what happens is they become the difficult person. You know, how I many, whether you know it or not, when we get ready to talk to somebody, if we know that we're going to talk to them and we know it's going to be a difficult situation or it's going to be a not so easy conversation, we go ahead and start rehearsing 
Just the rehearsal in our head can give us an attitude. And so when we get that person, we've already got an attitude, and that person may not even respond the way you think they're going to respond. So, so here we go. Get ready. Uh, the problems may have their origin within your own heart. Not within the other person. You think the other person is being difficult? But that means we just read it. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowness of mind, <coughs> that each esteem others better than himself. That each of you look out not only for your own interest, but also for the interest of others. Wow. Again, we just read that by giving you another version. Can, can you imagine how life would be if all of a sudden it weren't always what I get out of it? What do I get out of it? Hey, what, 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 what's in it for me? How's this going to look on my side? If I do that for you, how am I going to look if I help you and I don't get help? How am I going to look? I'm going to look weak. I'm going to look like... You hear people say that all the time. You know, and, and, and the thing is in all this is I don't care what you think about me as long as I'm thinking that God's loving me and for what I'm doing. I'm trying to please God, not everybody else. I mean, you cannot please everybody else. It's impossible to please everybody else. You heard about the chameleon that fell in the box of crayons. He exploded. <laughs> chameleon, the lizard that changes colors. He fell in the box of crayons. He tried to be all the colors at once. He exploded. Okay. <laughs> Throw that one out too. Y'all right, are, are, are a tough crowd today, I'm telling you. Make sure you're not the one being difficult. <laughs> one more time, I'm going to try it again. Make sure you're not the one being difficult. Oh, yeah. All right, here we go, here we go. Now, <laughs> number two, oh, I love sandpaper people. Don't you love sandpaper people? Every time you get around them, they rub you raw. Every time they get around you, they're going to tell you, look, here's how to use the starter food. It's none of my business, but... It's none of my business, but... Watch out. When everybody comes to me and goes, it's none of my business, but... I, all of a sudden, I start thinking, is it fine grit or is it thick grit? Because sandpaper's coming. Or they come to you and you go, well, I'm just looking out for you. I'm thinking, really? And so, so, so sandpaper people, they'll come to you and whenever they talk to you, you feel it. Just going, and you're trying to be godly. You're trying to, so look, look, look. But here's something you got to think about with, with sandpaper people. Some people, it's their personality. You have done the personality, done the personality test in here. Uh, a couple years back, we can do it again if y'all want to. I do it with people I'm counseling with them. I did it this week. I was doing a counseling session, and I did it with a married couple. Uh, uh, but, but here, in my fact, here's what's so cool about that personality uh, uh, inventory. What I do is I give it, I, give, I let the wife do one on herself, I let the husband do one on himself. I pull them back, then I let the husband do one on his wife, and the wife do one on her husband. And then I take the personality profile of the husband, his version and her version, and I put them together, and then I see where there's differences. And when I find the differences, usually that's where the problem is. Just, I mean, almost, it's almost 100% accurate on this. Okay, so, so, so some people, if they're, if they're caloric, the lion, or they're the beaver, uh, the melancholic, they are, they're most of the time, they are the sandpaper people. They don't mean anything by it. Most of the time, they don't even realize they're being the sandpaper people. So when these people come into your life, here's what you got to do. you got to think about something. You don't just, 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 just kick them to the curb because they're, they're there. Don't, don't try to change them. You know, one of the biggest problems with, with marriages is when they get married, usually there's something they don't like about the other spouse, and they say, don't worry, I can change them. Ha ha, everybody's been married for more than 30 seconds. Y'all do this. Ha! You're not going to change them. And if you did change them, then what you've done is you've really messed up the equation because God puts two people together not to compete, but to complete each other. 
And so because we're able to complete each other, here's how it's supposed to be. Here's me, or here's you, here's the husband, here's the wife, and we're supposed to get together. It's not like this. It's like this. Because my weaknesses are overcome by your strength. And your weaknesses are overcome by my strengths. And so usually when you see two people together, when God's putting them together, there's going to be a lot of differences. And you're not to change that difference, but you're to embrace that difference. Because what that difference does is it completes you. It makes you a whole person. It makes you different. It makes you very, a very dangerous person in the eyes of Satan when you learn to, to grasp your husband or your wife's weaknesses or their, excuse me, their differences and hold on to them and celebrate them instead of trying to change them. Amen? So, so people change when they want to, not when you want them to. Amen? How do you change people? You don't. People change when they want to, not when you want them to. Think about that now. I got just got to camp there for a minute. If somebody changes, if your spouse changes just because you said change, I promise you it's not going to last. Or I can promise you this, the person that's doing the changing just to satisfy the other person, either they're going to go back the way they were or they're going to resent you trying to change them. And then instead of an already a bad situation, now it becomes an unlivable situation. Because now you've taken that person out of their own comfort areas and comfort zones and taken about everything that they know and trying to put them in your, uh, uh, and, and what you want, in your box. And when you put them in your box, when they can't change or when it's rough, they will resent you. That's why we have semesters in school and semesters at college. Because I've got a, I, I've got a professor right now that's trying to change the way I do. But he's teaching me. And, and I keep looking at this man saying, I got to, you got to write this 20-page uh, capstone experience thing about you. And he says, here's what I want it to be like. And I'm thinking, I don't talk like that. I don't write like that. That's not the way I do. And then he writes back and says, you are a college student. You need to sound like one. You need to pronunciate like one. You need to write like one. Talk to all of us, not just to me. And I thought, I, I, I did do that, did not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so, so here we go. You know, and I said, I really, you know, but in that situation, I like him doing that, but it still hurts. I'm, I'm paying him to do that. But at the same time, I appreciate it because he's trying to make me better. But I don't appreciate everybody. You, know, you cannot please everybody you get around, and you'll never be. If you try to change for everybody, the Bible says, woe unto him that everybody, that no man, woe unto the man that nobody ever speaks ill of. That everybody likes him. You know why? Because that means he's not trying to do anything but be, but be what y'all want him to be. And I can't do that. How about you? Okay. So, we don't know how to break that person. We don't know where to break him. We don't even know how much to break him. This is God's job. Not mine. You know, uh, uh, I raised two boys. I very much enjoyed raising these boys. I had a blast as you know, they were coming up. Uh, of course, we had our own little ups and downs, and, and we had some hand-to-man talks and stuff like that. And, you know, they weren't, always, they weren't always rosy, but we had a good time. We had a wonderful time growing up. But even though I tried to raise them strong, and they're very strong morals and very strong leaders, that's, that's a fact, but they're so different. And if I expect them to be the same, then I will be taken away from one. They've got to still be their own self. You know, so, so it's important. You don't know where to break that person. If you break him in the wrong place, you may, you may hurt him for life. You may scar him for life or hurt for life. Plus, if you try to break that person because you don't know where to break them, you can ruin a relationship. So it's so important that you let God do the breaking because God knows where the breaking should take place. For it is God which worketh in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure. Philippians 2.13. 
So consider this. Ready? I know it's not pleasant. They may be God's sandpaper, and God could be changing you. Hmm. That person that right drives you crazy, that is on your last nerve every time you get around them. You know, they asked Ruth Graham if she ever had she ever thought about divorce. Her and Billy. She said, I ain't thought about divorce, but I sure have murders come across my mind a few times. <laughs> Even Billy Graham got on her nerves. Billy Graham? Yeah, <laughs> Billy Graham. Amen. Billy Graham still amen. Amen. And so, so it's important. The person that is driving you crazy right now could be God's sandpaper. Even in bad situations. Even situations where you wish that you had never even come in contact with that person. You wish you had never even seen that person before. The difficulties that you're experiencing with that person right now, and they could be gone out of your life, could be God and his sandpaper, and he's changing you. Wow. So number two, number, number two, don't try to change the other person. Number three, this is good, isn't it? Y'all are awful quiet. I can hear a pin drop in here. Hear that? Not the same kind of pin, but I didn't have the other kind. All right. So here we go. Show love and kindness to sandpaper people. Don't lecture. There are certain people that I can tell when their mind's made up and they're not even going to let you introduce something to them. Here's how you tell it. Listen carefully. When you go try to discuss something with somebody and they won't be quiet. You can't get a word in. You're trying to discuss the situation, but they're the only ones talking. You're trying to talk with them and tell them that, that, that there's a problem and we need to fix this, but they won't let you get a word in edgewise. That's somebody, honestly, only God can change. They're not going to listen to you. They don't want to have you hear what you got to say. And so they just monopolize the conversation. And just like a bulldozer, run over you. And so what I have discovered is when I get in contact, no matter how hard I'm trying to help these people, when they get and they get in my face and they just roll over like like pulling like a bulldozer, and I can't get a word in, then I just be quiet. And there's been some people for certain situations, I just stay quiet. Because every time I try to bring it up, I try to with the solution, they just roll over me like a steamroller. And so what I'm saying is, what I know is, God's showing me that they're not ready to change it. They're not ready to accept any kind of thought of their own. And so what I do is I say, it's quiet. And I say, God, you've got to do it. So, so what I have discovered is, instead of sitting there trying to fight with them, what I have found out is that lectures and spouses, please take this strongly to your own marriage. Lectures can turn into nagging. Male and female, husband and wife. Nag. Nag, 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 nag. Like a little feist dog at your heel, just nip it. And if you keep on nagging, you build walls instead of bridges. Because the more you nag, think about it this way, the more you nag, the more bricks go up. You start out looking at them face to face, but mentally and emotionally, you're looking at them face to face, but as the bricks go up, pretty soon you got to get up on your tiptoes to see them. And then emotionally, you don't even see them anymore, but they have a blank look on their face. Why? Because you have turned your lecture into nag. And when it's even perceived, it, but I'm just trying to do what I feel like I'm supposed to tell them. Well, tell them and leave it alone for a while. Let them, let them get it in their system. Let them think about it. Give them a chance to respond. I heard a guy 
one day, he was sitting in the chair, we were talking, and he said his wife nagged all the time. I said, she nagged all the time? He said, yes. And he said, and she said, give me an example of when I nagged at you. And he said, you told me I need to fix that front door. She said, I told you six months ago. I thought it was okay to bring it up now. He said, I'll get around to it when I get around to it. You're nagging. One time in six months? No. Again, both sides got to play this thing right. So, ledgers can turn into nagging. It builds walls instead of bridges. Since nagging usually creates more problems than it solves, save your breath. What did I tell you? If I'm trying to help somebody and they don't want to hear what I got to say or I'm trying to intervene and they just want to roll over me like a steamroller so I cannot talk or every time I try to mention something, they go, you don't understand. You don't understand. You got to blah, 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 blah. And, I'm sorry, but you, and I can't even get a sentence out. I just thought, save your breath. I say, God, you got to handle it because they, they're not ready to hear. Okay? Proverbs 15 says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. Proverbs 21 and 9 says, Better to dwell on the corner of a housetop than in a house shared with a contentious woman. Or man. Notice I didn't just leave woman up there, woman or man. Now I kept thinking, what does that mean? Dwell on the housetop, on the corner of a housetop, than to be in there where that person won't quit nagging, they won't do what bam, 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 nah, 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 nah. What I'm saying is, have you ever been on a rooftop? Have you ever fell off a rooftop? <laughs> it's not fun. What I found out about rooftops is that that's a place you got to, depending on the pitch of the roof, you've really got to watch what you're doing. And if you're on the edge, you might see that shingle, but sometimes under that shingle, there's nothing holding that shingle. Maybe the wood's rotten or you let the shingle, the shingle's going too far up over, there's nothing under that shingle supporting it. And you can fall off, you can lose things, you can drop stuff. And so when you're up there, you got to build your P's and Q's, and you got to watch everything you do because one wrong move and you could actually really kill yourself. And the Bible says it's better to dwell on that top of that house with all that danger than to have a man or woman in that house. Nappy, 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 nappy. Because again, all that does is stir up anger. So, don't lecture anybody that's hard to get along with. Don't lecture them unless you're their boss and you're trying to tell them how to do something. That's different. I remember, I, I remember uh, there was one of the engineers come to work for us and and, and they were not up on technology. They were way back, you know, way, way back in technology. And I told them, I said, you're going to be taking around 300 to 1,000 pictures a day. And you're going to sit down, you're going to sit with everybody, and you're going to learn how to do the processes, and then you're going to have to find out, get the processes, write them down, take pictures of every process as you're doing. It's actually 9,000. I said, you're going to do this. When you get through this, you got to then bring it to, to uh, their supervisor, make sure all the steps are in the right order and everything's right. Then you bring it to me. And I've got to look at it. If, I, if, the, if the man is doing the proofs, if his boss approves it, if I approve it, then, then, then we put it in the book. And so the person said, I don't know how to do any of that. I said, well, you just started. I said, don't worry, I'll take you, I'll get in the book with you, and, and I'll, I'll be there for you. And so I stayed. Normally I would stay about 15 minutes, show them what to do, and I'd leave. This day I stayed over an hour, probably two hours. I finally got up, and the person said, where are you going? I said, well, the first hour I didn't, you watched. The second hour you didn't, I watched you. I said, if there's going to be a third hour, they don't need both of us. <laughs> so one of us is going home, or one of us is going someplace else to work today. And I laughed. I was being funny. And the person said, well, I don't plan on going home. I said, well, I'm going somewhere else. And I got up and I walked out. Again, that's when you can lecture, when you're teaching somebody. But if you're not teaching them, if you're trying to get along with them, you, all you're going to do is if you just keep lecturing them, you've got to let God do it because God knows where the breaking point is. God knows where to break them in a way that's going to be positive, not negative. Amen? So don't lecture and it's good stuff. Y'all are about to shout me down. <laughs> All right. Do you recognize these people? I love them. First, there's the know-it-alls. The arrogant usually have an opinion on every issue. When they're wrong, they get defensive. 
The pastors, these people never offer ideas and let you know or let you know where they stand. The dictators, they bully and intimidate. They constantly are demanding and brutally cruel. Or cr cruel. <laughs> Critical. The yes people, they agree to any commitment, yet they rarely deliver. You can't trust them to follow through. There's the no people. They're quick to point out why something won't work, and what's worse, they're inflexible. Then there's the gripers. Is anything ever right with them? They prefer complaining to finding solutions. If, of course, you recognize them, they're the people you work with, you sell with, you depend on, you live with. Learn to deal with them quickly and confidently, because if you don't, you're going to despise every moment you're around them. Ready? Here's the last one. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Here's the last one. And I reckon I have to say this probably to the parents more than anybody else. Don't protect these people from their consequences. You can't walk around behind people and clean up their mess all the time. If you walk around and clean up their mess, they're going to continually do the same thing over and over and over again. When you protect other people from their consequences, you're doing, you're doing them a disservice. You become an enabler. I have sit in my office. I've been with people places. I have people come and talk to me. And they're saying, I have to walk behind that person and have to do this, 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 all the time. This, this, and I tell them, say, you need to stop it. And they go, but how are they going to survive if I stop it? And I go, stop it. They go, but I said, they're not going to die if, you don't, if, they, if they have to pick up their own clothes. They're not going to die. They're not going to die if they have to learn how to mow the grass. They're not going to die if they have to learn how to handle certain situations in their life. Because the longer you do for them, the more they're going to expect you to do it for them. And pretty soon, y'all actually, in an unhealthy way, become dependent on one another. And you get some unhealthy codependence. And that codependence is not good because now... You can't seem to survive unless you're covering up their mistakes, and they can't survive unless you're doing it for them. And so when you get out of their life through death or whatever, you really hurt that person because they don't know how to handle it. So do not protect them. Somebody, when these people are being hard to deal with, don't protect them from their circumstances. Let them see what they're doing, and do not be a disabler. See, what I have discovered is most people don't learn new behaviors until the old behaviors stop working. Wow. Hebrews 12, 5 and 6 says, And you've forgotten the exhortation that speaks to you, as to sons, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. You got somebody being hard to deal with. Stop cleaning up behind. I'm not talking about their from the floor, and I'm talking about the mess they make mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Don't keep walking behind, make fixing it, fixing it. If they mess it up, fix it. Because all you're doing is you're enabling them. They're not going to change. They're going to keep on doing it because they know you're there. That's a hard lesson to learn, but it's one you got to learn. Because if you don't, wow. You gotta trust them in God's hands. God knows where to break them, how to break them, what it's gonna take. You're not helping them. Guys, y'all come on up here and get ready to play something. Come up here, to DC. Come on up here, Jeff. Y'all come up here and get ready to play something on us for the altar and get ready to close. Giving y'all, look, I got a lot more to go, but I don't know if y'all can handle it. Ready? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that was great. That's the good book. That's the new book. Yeah. <laughs> that was awesome. Okay. I didn't even put the words up there. Y'all all stand.
make a change in the way you handle things. And so he sends you difficult people. And sometimes it's even double. He needs a change in you, plus the difficult person needs a change in them, so he puts y'all together. Not a very good marriage, so to speak. Not literal marriage, but not a good marriage because now you don't know. You're trying to help them. They're, they're not trying to help you. You got it going on. It's just, ah. Uh. I remember a family. I can't even count the times that the personnel manager said, I'm sending this person over to you to work with you, David. And I said, well, I don't need them. And they said, I'm sending them over there anyway because you can handle them. And whenever they would say that, I'd go, oh, no, sandpaper people. I don't like it, but I've learned to embrace it. And I say this, when the sandpaper people come, God, are you trying to change me? Or God, are you trying to help me change them? Or God, are we working together to help each other change? I remember there was this one guy working in engineering. He didn't work directly for me. He worked for somebody else, but he kept working projects with me. And he messed up constantly. Tearing down, we built literally. We would build block walls. He would tear them down. He'd run into them lift trucks. We would put things in a certain way so that we wouldn't get fined when the orders come in. He put them in wrong, and the orders would say, "You got this in wrong. You're not in charge of ten thousand dollars for that." Just constant. <laughs> and if anybody ever tried my patience, it was this guy. And I kept trying to not just help him as an employer, but I tried to serve him. I tried to think, what is one of my sons? Or what is one of my nephews or nieces or grandchildren? And so I, I gave them the second mile, the third mile, the fourth mile, the fifth mile. And finally one day he really, really messed up. And I walked up to him. And I held it and held it and I said, son, I've been trying to shield you as much as possible. But the powers over me are going to fire you if things don't change. And he looked at me so, oh, he was mad at me. And, I, and I'd been taking up for him and helping him. He was so mad at me. And within a couple of days, he quit. He just quit. They were going to fire me in a moment. He quit. And about three or four years later, I was in Ollie's at Christmas time. I was going to look for Bibles. They had great Bibles, very cheap. And I was going to buy like seven Bibles for my grandkids. And so I was trying to get these Bibles. And somebody walks up behind and puts their arm on me. I knew it was a big man. Kind of obvious, but he can, when he's heads over yours. And he pulls me to the side. And he thanked me. thanked me for telling him that we were going to fire him. And he said, I know I seemed angry at you. He said, I was just angry. He said, but I want to tell you something. If it hadn't been for you, I would have either been fired or quit a long time ago. And he said, I'll never forget it. And I said, it's okay. And I went walking out. He walked out and swore with me. And he's leaning in my car. <laughs> And he just, I think, when, I think the final words he said when I left was he said, I love you, man. He said, you really show God, and I thank you for it. The whole time after he left, I was thinking, do 
ain't right, and what happened, he's mad, he quit, blah, blah, blah. I had no idea the influence that I was having on him. You never know sometimes. You may never know. But you just got to trust God with the sandpaper pit. You got to trust God when people are being difficult. Because sometimes they're being difficult because they're hurting. And hurting people hurt people. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm going to ask a few hard, hard questions. Nobody looking around. I want you to be honest. Because today you're going to get some help. Nobody looking around so you can be free. How many here would say, I work with or have in my family? Put your hand up. I have sandpaper people. I have difficult people that I have to work with all the time. All right, put your hands down. Lord bless them. Now, how many people would say, I need God to really help me with these difficult people? Nobody looking around. Would you put that hand up? I need God to help me. I need him. I need him. Y'all, your eyes are closed. It's okay. The people closed. Do not open them. But hands are going up everywhere. I just want you to know that. Now I'm asking you a hard thing. This is the hardest of all. The next time you are surrounded by the difficult people, can I challenge you to ask yourself, and you're going to say yes when putting your hands up, can I challenge you to ask yourself, God, today, at this moment, am I the one being difficult? If you're willing to do that, put your hand up. Right there, healing just started. I know some of you didn't even feel it.
help me to check myself first and see if I'm being difficult. And wherever you show me, whatever area that you show me, help me surrender to you. And then I surrender, say this, and I surrender that difficult person to you. And I thank you for what you're doing. And I thank you for the healing that's taking place in my spirit right now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Give the Lord a hand time of praise. Give him a hand time of praise. And now the altars are open. If you need to pray for anything, come on up here. The altars are open. You never, never, at any time, when these church doors are open, that altar is always open. From the time the church doors open to the time the church doors close, this altar is always open if you want to come up here. I just found that it's been so much better doing the altar calls live than doing them because more people get involved and it gets more people in the prayers. God is awesome. Oh, God. Try it tomorrow, today. Whenever it happens, as soon as you see the difficult person coming, or the, say, Lord, let there be a light in their situation. And if they're already being difficult, you ask yourself, Lord, am I the one being difficult? Ask yourself. Because you know what he'll do? He don't, cut, he don't cut any punches. He'll tell you, yeah, you're the one being difficult. And so just show, show me where, Lord, and help me. Help me. Because I'm here to tell you something right now. Sandpaper's not pleasant. But I noticed something. When you have a paint job, Anybody ever heard of orange peel? Anybody ever painted something and got orange peel in it? That's not a little orange. It looks like an orange peel with little spots in it. There's other things in paint. Sometimes that sandpaper can take care of it. So there's some people, maybe maybe God's sending people because in your own life you got some orange peel. And God's sending them to smooth it out. You know, the craziest thing, this is the craziest thing. Uh, Wednesday, I was in Newburn. I was there. I went to see several people, Norma and, and uh, uh, Helen and uh, uh, Maxine. And while I was there seeing all these ladies, I stopped at, at the uh, nursing home where Helen was at. I'm walking out, and somebody's going to college or taking a similar degree, and and so they were asking me some questions, and so I was trying to answer the questions. And I heard, well, the owner of a Buick license plate, blah, 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 please come to the nurse's desk. And I looked at her, and I said, well, that's kind of funny, because I'm driving a Buick. I said, I wish you'd have said, I don't know the license, but I wish you'd at least said the color. And then they said again, well, the owner of a Buick license number, blah, 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 come in. And I said, she said, it may be you. I said, they didn't say a color. I'm just going to rebuke that. They called a third time, so I walked up and I said, I drive a Buick, is it a blue Buick? And they said, sir, is it close to the building? I said, yes, in a, a safe parking spot. Safe parking spot in the lines. I backed up, made sure I was in the lines. They said there's a Hummer out there that's ran over you. All I can think of was, here we go again. I walked out there and actually the Hummer was there, the man was there, and he had backed in my car and he put a big old D in it. And I saw it there and I said, and the man was about, he was shaking, he's about to cry. I put my arm around him. I said, are you okay? He said, I'm fine. I said, how's your Hummer? He said, really? <laughs> and I saw the dent in my car and I said, I can pull that out. With, with, with uh, I can pop it out, I believe. He said, well, here's the insurance information. It was really funny, though, because he said, he pulled out and had the same kind of insurance. He pulls out his insurance and says, here's what I'm going to ask you. Was there any injuries? And I'm inside the nursing home when he hits it, right? He says, is there any injuries? I said, well, come think of it. <laughs> and he said, and he said, I know that ain't happening. I said, I'm playing, man. I'm playing. And I said, there's nothing of your insurance. 
insurance go over three years for this? Just, just go. He said, well, you got my number, you got my stuff. I said, I know, but just, just go. And, he, and I mean, I put my fist in the den. <laughs> so I can pull it out. And so I rode away from there, and one side of me says, you big dummy. The insurance will have fixed that for you. But the other side of me says, yeah, but what would, what, really, this is one of the situations, but what would Jesus have done? And so, yeah, he just spoke to him, popped him out, and he just said, ow, come out. <laughs> he just popped right back out. <laughs> and so, so, so again, I just told him, go ahead. I still have his insurance stuff. He said, if you ever want your insurance, go ahead, that's fine, but I, I just can't, I, I, honestly, I didn't feel at peace. I reckon if he'd have been mean or if he'd have been whatever, but he wasn't. And, and we were both visiting the Alzheimer's unit. He was visiting his mother. I was visiting Helen. So just my heart went out to him anyway. So, uh, But again, this week, number one, you need to ask yourself, God, am I being a sandpaper person? God, am I going to be difficult? And when this difficulty starts, God, how can I be a light in this difficulty? You'll see things change. They will change. Maybe not exactly like you want them to, but they will change. Amen? God's good. All the time. All the time. Thanks to what you would have done so that when I 